Hey, Internet and Melly. Um, it's Casey, and this is 25 in 52. This week, um, no fancy title screen, because I don't have time, um, and because the rest of this video is going to be long. I gave my first sermon yesterday, and Melly just left after a wonderful weekend here. Um, so I'm going to share with you the video she took of my sermon. Um, it starts out a little shaky and then, you know, continues on. Um, I'm going to put some links in the stuff so that you can read the quotes that I'm referring to. Um, and so you can have the information that I'm referring to in there. Um, I'm also going to put a link to the podcast that my church does of the sermon, um, in case you want to listen to it instead of watch me do it. I don't know. Um, and there will also be later a video with Melly and I sitting right about here and babbling at each other. Anyway, it's time to get going. Next thing you'll see is me doing the preaching. His story, as told to a translator, was published in a recent issue of the New York Times. In it, he discusses the horrors of force feeding and the degradation of daily life inside Guantanamo Bay. He also explains how he got there. As a young man in Yemen, he was making $50 a month in a factory, trying to support his family. When a friend told him that there were jobs in Afghanistan that would pay better, he went. I was wrong to trust him, he says. There was no work. I wanted to leave, but had no money to fly home. After the American invasion in 2001, I fled to Pakistan like everyone else. The Pakistanis arrested me when I asked to see someone from the Yemeni embassy. I was then sent to Kandahar and put on the first plane to get home. In the comments of the online version of the story, people state that because he is Yemeni, he is clearly a terrorist that it is his fault for being in Afghanistan in 2001, and that he and all prisoners should be thankful to American citizens because our tax dollars pay for the food that they are force fed. <laughs> I know that the first rule of the internet is don't read the comments. <laughs> and I know that what I'm going to read is only going to make me upset. But I am constantly struck in cases like these by how intensely some people cling to their narratives of other people's lives. One of the first things that I learned when I started my work as a counselor at Free Term was that everyone I would interact with would have a whole story all their own, a whole world of things that were not me going on that would affect how our time together went. My boss explained it initially as a, a donut. Abortion is about donuts. Um, as a donut. On the middle of the donut, there is the woman. And in the outside of the donut, there are all of the other things that are happening in her life. Family, bills, religious community, school, work, and on and on. She has a whole story all her own. We all do. The problem is that while we're busy getting caught up in our own stories, it's easy to forget the depth of other people's experiences. You may have noticed that the first word in the title of this service, Sonder, is not, strictly speaking, a real word. <laughs> it does not appear in the dictionary. You can't play it in Scrabble. It is a Latin <laughs> word from another language. It's not that. It is, in fact, simply something that someone on the internet made up. However, the concept explained by this made-up word is something very familiar to me. Patients enter my life for an hour or so. <coughs> we connect, or not so much, and then they leave. And whatever happens once they're outside of my counseling room, I don't always know what happens. On a daily basis, I'm made aware of my role as a temporary character in someone else's life. And it's not just them. Sometimes it's a little thing. When I look at people driving cars that look like mine, I tend to think a little more deeply about their lives. We share this experience, this car, and for a moment I recognize myself in them. I 
am never anyone to them, and they are never anyone to me. But for that moment, we connect. And as soon as this happens, it stops, and we're back where we were. Nameless, faceless blips, scenery for each other's lives. Sometimes it's much bigger than that. Once, as I was aimlessly clicking around Wikipedia, as you do, I happened upon a list of the world's largest cities by population. As I read, I was impressed by the number of cities much larger than any I've ever been in that exist in parts of the world that I never think about. Particularly jarring to notice was that the most populous city in Nigeria, Lagos, has a population well over twice the size of the Cleveland, Akron, Illyria combined statistical area. Not one of those people knows anything at all about KC Slack from Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Nor are they ever likely to know. But all of those people are living whole lives with families, friends, struggles, and joys as real to them as mine are to me. They don't know or think about me as an individual, and I don't know or think about them as individuals. Here we all are. Seven billion plus stories happening not only simultaneously, but interdependently. It would be hard, if not impossible, to consider all seven billion plus people on this planet and their full, complex lives all the time. The sheer hugeness of that number makes imagining seven billion of anything very difficult for our brains. And seven billion unique, complex things, unlikely. We have to abstract. Of course, abstractions cause different problems. We tend to homogenize groups and create stereotypes, both good and bad. We can't help it. Our brains naturally create these sort of categories as a way of processing information. The same processes that lead us to create poor abstractions of people we've never met are the ones that permit us to distinguish a horse from a table. <laughs> the problem is when we let our stereotype categories overtake our realization that people we've never met, who may not seem like us, are also just if we're not paying attention, our imaginations can fail us, sometimes to disastrous effect. However, it's difficult to feel terribly surprised by our failure to imagine people we don't know and have never met, as we are often engaged in misimagining even the people we know best. <coughs> in his book, Paper Towns, which we heard an excerpt from earlier, John Green writes about a teenage boy who has over the course of his life become fascinated with his next door neighbor, a similarly, similarly aged girl who everyone in the school adores. One night, she appears at his window to take him on a crazy adventure, and he decides that she is meant to save him from the tedium of his daily life and help him make him into the man he's supposed to be. Of course, she's not. <laughs> Green magnificently tears apart the manic pixie dream girl archetype so familiar to young people from movies like Garden State and 500 Days of Summer, and in doing so, offers us all some wisdom. It is easy to forget how full the world is of people, full to bursting, and each of them imaginable and consistently misimagined. The only things any of us really knows are the things we experience ourselves. Stimuli from our senses, processed by our brains, coming together to create what we call reality, and thoughts flying around inside our minds, making sense of those stimuli. For the most part, this system works out pretty well. We go around, able to distinguish horses from tables, interacting with our surroundings, and having generally a good time. It will come to no surprise, come as no surprise to you, though, that where this all breaks down, is in our understanding of other people. We see only snapshots of other people, moments in time presented to us with varying degrees of intentionality. I only know about you what you're willing to let me see. And you only know about me 
what I'll show you. Since we typically don't spend every waking hour with any particular other person, and we certainly aren't privy to the workings of their mind and the way they experience the world, there is necessarily an extent to which we have no choice but to imagine in order to fill in the gaps. Anyone who has ever been given a gift that makes no sense to them, or who has had someone insist that something was so you, you don't feel that's true at all, <laughs> has experienced being imagined. But it's more than that. It's the tension that appears as children become teenagers and find that though they've changed, their parents' perception of them has not. It is those same children failing to see that their parents had whole lives before they were born and will continue to do so as they grow up. It's the moment as a relationship dissolves where you begin to wonder who exactly you were in a relationship with in the first place, <laughs> if this is who this person is. <laughs> It's the pedestal that forces people to hide the places where they are weak, and it's the derision that causes people to feel and be seen as if all they have are faults. In Samir's story, we see very clearly the results of our imaginative failures on a global scale. In our lives, our families, and our communities, we see the results of more localized misimagining. These results range from awkward to tragic, and keep us in all situations from experiencing the transcendent beauty of knowing a person for who they are, rather than the collection of stereotypes they have been forced into. When we imagine people flatly, we fill in the gaps with images from our own minds. More than we see them, we see a reflection of who we are and what we believe to be true about the world. We're recreating them, but without the necessary patterns or tools to rebuild them correctly. It's like if you were a painter, and you were going to paint an apple, and all you had was orange paint. <laughs> you would paint something that looked kind of like an apple, but could really easily be confused for an orange. <laughs> if we're going to recreate people with the dimension and complexity that they actually have, we're going to need to be sure that we have the right tools. James Baldwin wrote, you think your pain and heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all of the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. I think he's right. Engaging with writing and other works of art that come from the heart and tell stories of human lives and emotions is among the best ways to flesh out our understanding of the human experience. When we read, we get caught up in the story of someone else's life. If both the book and the reader are doing our jobs, we feel for people who are not only not us, but who don't exist at all. <laughs> the same experience can be had in viewing a painting or a sculpture or listening to a song. However, even if I read all the books available about people like me, from a book that's like book, I'll still be missing a whole lot of the story. We have to reach outside of our comfort zones, outside the markets of media that are meant for us. Read a book by an author from a country that you're not familiar with. Watch a film made by queer teenagers in Utah, listen to Muslim hip hop from the Middle East, or slam poetry made in San Francisco. Learn about the emotions and the lives of people that you have never met. And think. Think about what you're being taught by the media that you consume. Consider what audience these works are intended for and what their creator's purpose was in producing them. I'm not saying that everything you consume needs to be highbrow intellectual material. I'm saying that while you're exploring material, media, it's important to cultivate an awareness of how you're being taught to view the world. Not all art comes from the depths of someone's soul. Some is propaganda. Pay attention to how marginalized people are portrayed in the media you consume. Who are the bad guys? What markers are used to let you know that someone is good? Who has what 
gods. Why might someone want you to believe that? What works and for whom? A breadth of media experiences tempered with media literacy gives you both a wider range of stories when you're recreating other people in your mind and a filter to keep oppressive cultural constructions from muddying your metaphorical paint. There is no substitute, however, for real experiences with real human beings. Knowing, loving, and being in relationship with other individuals, dealing with them on a level beyond the surface, seeing them for the beautiful, complex, and flawed individuals they are, and loving them all the same is the best practice for learning to imagine people outside of your world complexly. It has the added benefit of strengthening our communities and our relationships, lifting us all up together. Surah 49, verse 13 of the Quran begins, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know one another. As Unitarian Universalists, with our belief in both the inherent worth and dignity of every person and the interconnectedness of all existence, I believe we are especially called to and especially suited to the work of finding ways to better know each other. And I believe that the Quran makes a point here that we should be careful not to miss. We exist in communities. We are born in families, we make friends, and we choose organizations, religious and otherwise, in which to participate. In communities, looking more deeply into each other's differing experiences and realities can be ever so slightly easier. You know that on some level, everyone in that community is, is, is in some way invested, that they care about at least some of the things that you care about, and you necessarily spend some amount of time with them. From there, if you try, you can learn more about them, have conversations about how they think and feel and what's important to them, what brings them joy and what scares them. You can have these conversations that let you see them as whole, complex people, rather than snapshots and stereotypes. Learning to have those conversations, unfortunately, is not easy. It is not even the sort of thing where you learn how to do it and then bam, you never rely on a stereotype again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a process. It's a constant striving to see the detailed beauty in the pure humanity of friends, family members, neighbors, and strangers. Done right, it probably takes your whole life. There are, however, some tips. Things you can try doing that can make it easier to have real and meaningful connections with one another. <clears throat> one, be present with yourself. I could honestly talk for a whole other sermon about this, but at its base level, being present with yourself involves noticing what is true about you in any given moment. Doing this allows you to notice how someone else's words make you feel and what frameworks you're drawing up when you try to recreate them in your mind. If I'm present with myself, I know if I'm getting irritated with someone because they've said something hurtful or because I'm hungry and overtired. <laughs> we practice this sort of presence when we meditate or are simply still by ourselves for a while. You can also practice this by sitting quietly and noticing sensations in your body as we did during our meditation today. Two, be present with whomever you're talking with. Put away your phone, stop, and li listen. Don't try to listen to five other conversations happening around you. Listen to that one. And if you can, just for a moment, Put whatever chatter is happening in your brain on the back burner. Listen when they speak. Don't spend all your time trying to decide what you'll say next. Instead, hear what they have to say. Pause. And then respond. Three. Remember that they are only people. We are all constantly engaged in mismanagement one another. 
and that goes equally for the people you're interacting with as it does for you. They may believe things about you that are as untrue as the things you may believe about them. But if you can be present and listen, they will often begin to open up to you as well. And you will both find yourselves more able to see one another's humanity. As we attempt to experience the diversity of possibilities in human lives and come together in communities, we are not only practicing imagining one another complexly, we are engaging in the holy work of hearing each other. We are sharing the sacred truths of our humanity and growing together in love. So may it be. Join with me now, rise in body or spirit as you are willing and able in our closing hymn. 1014 in your teal hymnal, standing on the side of love. 